very well know. Uh, as you very well know, we are doing uh, SPSS today. So we're going to talk about the basics of SPSS. SPSS is something that we can study for six years, basically, without fully learning all of it. So um, do not expect to be an SPSS expert after you're done with this workshop, but at least you will have an idea of what, uh, how to get started and what are the basic functions that we can do. So that's the purpose of this. So let's take a look at some of the stuff that we will be talking about. Um, so we will be talking about descriptive statistics. If you have a data set, we of course want to know things like the mean, the median, the uh, standard deviations. SPSS can allow us to do this, but then again, so can Excel. So what is the benefit of SPSS? We'll talk about that versus Excel. Um, one is going to be the types of data that we're able to deal with. So I'll mention to you exactly what type of data we're able to input. Um, and we'll run through a lot of examples. Um, I'm using, I'm not maximizing the screen of this because we're going to be switching back and forth from PowerPoint to SPSS. So I don't want to keep going full screen and then minimizing. So instead, we will just leave this on this uh, smaller setting. Um, we'll talk about graphical summaries. One of the main advantages of SPSS is that you're able to do many, many types of graphical analysis. Um, stuff that Excel does not allow you to do. Um, and also, it's, it's a little bit easier to do as well. Um, So uh, we'll talk about the different types of variables we're able to do this with as well. Um, the two main types of variables we deal with in SPSS are categorical and quantitative. Um, we'll define what those are and we'll go through what each one means as well. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the differences uh, when we are talking about groups. And um, one of the main things in statistics that we often wanna figure out is are there differences, <coughs> excuse me, um, as you might have heard, by the way, the reason this is online is because I was tested corona positive uh, a couple days ago. So um, while I feel fine, I physically can't go to campus. So I might be coughing a little bit, but otherwise I am perfectly um, fine. Um, so, um, so as I was saying, one of the reasons uh, we use SPSS or we do any type of statistics is because we have two groups of things, people, data, whatever, and we want to compare them, right? Um, there's a lot of differences that we can compare. We could say one thing is bigger than the other, but the problem is at what point does that uh, difference begin to matter? Um, so for instance, if I say that there's, you know, two, a brother and a sister, and the brother is older than the sister. Okay, the brother is older, we know this. However, at what point does that not begin to matter? So for instance, if I tell you the brother is one year older than the sister, you'd probably say, okay, that, that's an older child. What, what if I said they were twins and the brother was 10 seconds older than the sister? would it matter in the same capacity? And of course it wouldn't, right? Um, if for any intended purposes, we say one's 10 seconds older than the other, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter, right? So we need to understand at what point does data, does differences in data actually matter? And at what point does it not? So of course we use statistical analysis for this. Um, one way to do it is for um, data that is categorical, we use what's called chi-squared tests. And then for data that is quantitative, uh, meaning it's numbers, we use hypothesis testing, basically t-tests. So either way, we can be able to tell the differences between groups. And then lastly, kind of the, uh, the, the, the in the medical term, you know, uh, the steroid in the arsenal of SPSS, the thing that is, the solution to everything, so to speak, is regression analysis. Um, 
and that is kind of the most powerful tool that we're able to use in SPSS. Um, there's multiple types of it. We're going to talk about two in today's lecture. Um, one is linear regression, and the other one is binary logistic regression. I'll tell you the differences between them and what each one means. So those are the topics that uh, I would like to cover today. Um, of course, if we finish early or if there's additional time and you have questions and you would like to talk about other types of um, analysis, we can talk about that. Um, but I believe you know these are kind of the major ones that we want to talk about. Um, of course, I also wanted to select topics that are easy enough for you guys to follow along. Um, there's other things that we could do, but for those, we would need survey data or other types of data um, which we might not have access to. So for that reason, I have three data sets that are ready to go for us to use um, in today's workshop. So we'll be using and sticking to those. Um, if you have questions, by the way, feel free to ask at any time. Um, I, I'm trying to monitor the um, the chat box. If it's you know if somebody pops up a question, I'll be happy to answer it at any point. Yes, Rueda. Uh, sir, can we have these documents? Can we have uh, a copy of the PowerPoint and these uh, documents you will using uh, you will be using in SPSS? So we will practice on them later. Uh, sure, I can. Uh, so uh, as of I don't know how. Uh, if you can follow along with me. Um, the, the, I guess the, the basic thing is, um, this is being recorded now, so you could always watch the recording and then uh, follow along with it on your own time. I think that would be the best bet. I will send all the documents that I'm going to use today um, to Amrutha. And then Amrutha, you can share it with everyone. Yeah, actually the recordings will be uh, published in the YouTube channel of CGS. Okay, and then the documents themselves you can send to all the participants. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Okay, so that way you'll have the um, the files that we're dealing with, uh, the SPSS files, and then also this, uh, so uh, the, the PowerPoint. <coughs> once again, excuse my coughing once in a while here. Um, all right, so let's start off with the basics of SPSS. Um, there is something that we call descriptive summaries or descriptive statistics. Um, generally, a descriptive statistic run in SPSS will give you five things. You run this on one set of data, meaning one variable, and it will give you within that variable the minimum, the median, the maximum, as well as the Q1 and Q3 percentiles of that data. So the 25th percentile and the 75th percentile. Um, so basically, if you look at the minimum, it's gonna be the lowest number. Q1 is gonna be one quarter of the way through. Median is gonna be half. Q3 is gonna be three quarters. And the maximum is going to be, of course, the maximum of uh, that data set. So this can be interesting to see, um, depending on what your data set is. You can kind of look at whether there's outliers or not, things like that. Um, of course, the mean, uh, is also a good uh, thing to look at. Oftentimes what we tend to do is we compare medians with means. If the mean and the median are very far apart, generally that means there is a, an outlier somewhere. Remember, the median is just the middle number of a range. Meanwhile, the mean is going to be the average of all numbers. So if I have 100 points from 1 to 100, the median is going to be 50. In that case, also, the average is going to be 50. But if I take the last number and I replace it with 1 million, the median is still going to be 50, which is an accurate representation of all 99 data points aside from the one outlier. But the mean, of course, would be heavily weighed in that case, right? So the mean would be much higher than the median in that case. And that would show us, OK, there's something not quite right with this data set. Um, standard deviations, how far things are from the mean, also important, um, and variance uh, is the squared uh, standard deviation. Uh, basically, um, it will always be a positive number. Standard deviations can be both positive and negative, depending on how far you are from the mean. Um, this is basic statistics, right? I expect everyone that is here to have 
some knowledge of this stuff already. So generally, this is going to be um, the basics. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so let's take a look at this. How would we get this done in SPSS? So I have given you instructions on what to do in SPSS here. Um, we're going to open a file called gssnet, which I found on the internet because I was searching for data sets the other day. So when we click on an SPSS file, if you look here, it's a .sav file. That is an SPSS saved file. And SPSS will open up. Um, generally, SPSS takes forever to open. It is extremely slow. Um, not much we can do about that. Um, my computer is actually not weak by any means, um, but I still have trouble running SPSS. Um, now, whenever we open up this data set, generally you're going to open up to this page. Um, let me move it down a little bit here. Um, so the first thing you will see is all of this data. So just like with Excel, it's very similar to Excel. Um, if we go down here, you will see how many data points we have. In this case, we have, uh, where is it? 1,419 data points. And for each data point, we have a whole bunch of different variables. Once again, nothing has diverged or is different than regular um, than uh, regular Excel so far. So uh, you will start noticing that there are different types of um, guys. Every time you send something, this whole thing comes down. So if we could uh, send our numbers at the end, maybe, and only use this if you have co uh, questions for now, because every time it pops up, it, it disrupts the screen sharing. Um, so that being said, uh, where was I? Um, so we have a bunch of different variables. Now, each one, we have different variable names. And each one, we have different variable. Uh, you see there's a little um, logo next to each one. This logo tells you the type of data that it is. Um, we have three types of data within uh, SPSS that we're able to use. Um, when you see a ruler, that means it's a scale. We'll talk about this in a moment, but a scale in essence is a range of numbers. Um, this is an indefinite range. I, I, once again, guys, don't send your ID number. You can send it at the end. I would like to only see questions. If there's a question, then you chat. Otherwise, we'll send all the IDs at the end. Um, so uh, there's two views, basically, in SPSS. As I mentioned, um, each variable has its own uh, description. So here, for instance, we go to age. Um, we could put a label on it. So it says a uh, the name of the column is age. The label is age of respondent, the type is numeric, and the measure is scale, meaning it is a scale from, you know, a scale can be any type of scale. Um, now we have other types of data as well. This one is called ordinal. Ordinal means there is uh, not an inherent difference in terms of how big the numbers or the gaps in the numbers are. For instance, if you're doing a Likert scale analysis, um, you know, in a Likert scale, we generally have agree, disagree, um, neutral in the middle. So if I say, if I tabulate neutral is zero, agree is one, and disagree is negative one, that doesn't mean there's a minus one difference between neutral and disagree, right? So this is why we call this ordinal. There's an order. Uh, what do you mean more views? What do you mean by that?
So no, SPSS has default two views. So I'll show you what the other view is in a moment, but whenever you're doing the, um, whenever you're running an SPSS, these are the two views you're gonna have, data and variable. Um, very similar to when you have, you know, uh, in Excel, two spreadsheets. But of course, these two are linked together. Um, so once again, I'll show you for instance, age right here. Um, if we go to variable view, you now see a whole nother list. These are all of our variables that we're using, 47 variables in this uh, spreadsheet. Um, and each one has a bunch of descriptions. So for instance, we have our name of the variable, age, the type it is, whether it's numeric, it can be comma, dot, scientific notation. You know, you're not gonna use 90% of these. Um, generally what we end up using is numeric, Maybe once in a while you use dates, um, but string. So those are the two big ones. Um, we can also tell SPSS how big you want that uh, column to be. How many numbers can it be? So I could put it to be 100 digits, and then it could be 100 digits long. But gener uh, generally, numeric and string are going to be the two that we often deal with. Um, with, once again, how big do you want this to be? Age cannot be greater than two. So if somebody's 100, it will not let you input that. Um, decimals with age, we don't care about decimals, so we won't say there's decimals. Um, then we can put a label that tells you a little bit more because we look at age or, you know, age we can kind of understand, but age cat or, uh, you know, eduk. We don't know what this might mean. If somebody else opens this spreadsheet, they might not know what this is. So we put a label in here to kind of give a, a more of a, a description. So in this case, it says highest year of school completed. So that's what eduk means. Age is, once again, age of respondent. <coughs> also, it tells you that it is a value or a range of values um, maximizing at 98 or 99. Um, basically in this case, what it's trying to tell you, um, is that we don't want zero 98 or 99. We want to leave those out. We're not including those. Um, so you can basically put a range of anything you want. Um, anytime you have a value outside of that, um, it will omit it or flag it for you. So you can look back at it. Um, anyway, the biggest input one or, uh, import one, he, or the biggest important thing here is going to be this measure. As I mentioned, there's three measures, scale. When we have age, age is a scale. We can say that two years is double the size of one year. It is a finite measurable element. However, in terms of a Likert scale, what I mentioned to you guys last time, uh, agree, disagree, and um, neutral. We cannot say that neutral is double um, agree. It doesn't make sense. All we can say is that they are in order from smallest to largest. So that's what we use ordinal for. And nominal is there is no uh, relation between the numbers and the magnitude of the numbers. So for instance, gender, I can code male is one and female is two. Does that mean female is twice male? No, it doesn't make any sense. Does that mean because two is higher than one, that female is larger than man? That doesn't make sense either. So that's why we call this nominal. It's a name-based variable. And in this case, it is just arbitrary um, associations of numbers to categories. So these are the three things that you need to understand from here, depending on which measure you choose, SPSS will allow you or not allow you to do certain uh, calculations. So as I mentioned to you uh, in passing, T values or T tests can only be done on scales. If you have a nominal variable, it will not allow you to do a T test of that. It's that simple. All right, so um, once again, guys, if you have questions, let me know. Um, I'm, uh, if there's no questions, I'm gonna assume you guys are with me.
So let's take a look at descriptive variables. So um, we're going to get a descriptive variable. Let's see, we're gonna go uh, up here. We have our, if you're a Mac user, you're familiar that everything's up here, but if you're a PC user, it would be at the top of this uh, window but we're gonna to go to analyze. We spend the majority of our time in SPSS in under this analyze function or analyze tab. So we're gonna to go to analyze. We're gonna to go to descriptive statistics and we're going to go to descriptives. Let me see what the question is. String, oh, uh, so once again, if we go back there, by the way, um, a string is written. So this opposite of numeric. So numeric means you're inputting a number. String means you're inputting uh, letters. So for instance, um, when I am doing gender, I could either code it one, two as males and females, or I could write it out. Every category could have male and female. If I did male and female, that would be string. If I did one and two and coded them, that would be um, a numeric. Does that make sense? I'm assuming it makes sense. Um, all right, so and I will give you an example of uh, um, a string variable in a moment. I don't think there is one in this spreadsheet, but there is one in the other one. So, all right, let's take a look. Um, we can choose whatever variables we want to have descriptive statistics for. So in this case, I'm gonna go with the first one. Let's look at age. What can we see about the age of our respondents? <laughs> you know, there's some other options here. Um, as I told you, the generic thing is you're gonna see um, mean, standard deviation, minimum, maximum. We could see variance. Uh, where was standard deviation was already there. Um, and we can see a few others if we wanted to see it. Um, you can choose exactly what you want to see. But in this case, I'm curious about mean, standard deviation, minimum, and maximum. So I will click OK. And SPSS pops up a very nice little table for you. So we have a minimum age of 18, maximum age of 89, and a mean age of 46.56 with the standard deviation being at 17.3. So very simple. We could do this for any number of our variables. Um, so let's take a look at another variable. Um, which one is this? I believe this is number of hours worked per week. I could run multiple variables at the same time. So let's do that. I'll show you that uh, as well. Um, this is one that I'm gonna be using later on as an example. Um, number of hours worked in a week for our 1400 respondents and the hours of email per week that they use. So how many hours they spent on email. So let's run that and we get one table for both. So in the uh, number of hours worked last week, we have three, total of 909 responses for that one, by the way. Notice that for this one, for age, we have 1417. For this one, we only have 909, which means not all of the people provided this information. Same with the 651. Not all people provided this information in our survey, for instance. So uh, number of hours worked ranges between three and 89 with an average of 42. And um, number of hours spent on email ranges from zero to 60. Um, and then the average for that is 4.38. So we see the 60 is extremely high compared to our mean, which means the majority of our data points are gonna be closer to the zero range and not this 60, right? Same thing goes for uh, in our hours worked, 389, actually that was pretty good, right? 42 is pretty much in between halfway between three and 89, which means that this is more likely to going to be a, a normal distribution as opposed to this one, which will have some outliers on the end. All right, so valid N means how many 
uh, people you're able to use between the two. So for instance, here, I only had one variable, right? So valid n means that it is a, I have n, n being the number of respondents, right? In this case, I can use all 1,417 people um, as responses because everyone completed this. However, in this, only 909 completed out of 1,417. In this variable, 651 out of 1,417 completed. Now, that doesn't guarantee you that the same 651 completed this one as well, right? There could be gaps. So this tells you 530 people completed both of these, right? So if we're trying to do a comparison, for instance, between these two, we need to understand that we don't have all 651 people in both categories. We only have 530 people in both categories. All right. Um, <coughs> so, so that is descriptive statistics. It's fairly straightforward, um, gives you basic information about your variables. So let's move on. So let's talk about the different types of variables. As I mentioned to you guys, we have two main types of data. One is what we call categorical. The other one is what we call quantitative. Um, categorical means things fall into a specific category. Um, within these certain categories, as I mentioned, male, female, right? Those are very distinct categories. Um, if I told you Likert scale responses, right? With the agree, disagree, neutral, those are categorical. They're categorical, but they're a type of categorical that we called ordinal, right? Because it designates an order. Um, one is higher or lower than the other. <coughs> but nonetheless, both of these are categorical data. On the other hand, the opposite of this would be quantitative data. Quantitative data is um, scalar. These are going to be scales. They're going to be numerical values that represent magnitudes in difference, right? One is half of two. These are the types of things that we want to keep track of. So in quantitative, we're able to do these types of uh, calculations. In categorical, we cannot. Now, going within this, in quantitative data, we have two types. One is discrete. Discrete means they are specific numbers. Um, so, for instance, um, if I'm looking at shoe sizes, shoe sizes are, you know, let's say U.S. sizes, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Maybe you can go to ten and a half, you know, and have half sizes. So six, six and a half, seven, seven and a half. But we know for a fact that there's no quarter sizes or uh, specific decimal places, right? You're not going to have a shoe size of six point seven five or 6.93, um, those are not going to be uh, uh, possible. So for that reason, shoe size, for instance, would be a discrete variable. It's a discrete quantitative variable. Um, that means it is separate numbers. It is not a continuous scale. On the other hand, a continuous scale could be something like height. You could be 1.534982 meters tall. If you have the ability to measure it, you can be it. Um, so that would be an example of a continuous quantitative variable. So both of these are treated in the same way in SPSS. There's no distinction between discrete or continuous, but you should still have a general idea of the differences between those two. <coughs> All right. Now, some other things that we need to keep in mind. Um, now, whenever we're doing, yes, as we've discussed, the session will be recorded and shared. Um, so whenever we're doing uh, our analysis, there's a few numbers we can uh, look at or a few things we can look at to kind of 
keep track of things. Um, one is parameters. Generally, we can look at, uh, remember, we have a population and we have a sample. Um, oftentimes, we can have parameters belonging to a population, and then we take a subsample of that or a sample from there. Um, a parameter is a summary, as we just did, a descriptive analysis of the entire population. So in some cases, um, let's say we're doing a, a, a sample of the university students, and we want to know age. Um, we have data on this, right? We have data about the entire university and every student's age. That is a parameter. We know, let's say for, I'm gonna make up a number here, <coughs> excuse me, but let's say the average age of all the students in the university is 25. I don't know if that, that sounds high. Let's say 20. Um, however, we took a sample. And that sample of, let's say, 50 students, the average age was 40. I would hazard a guess to say that there's something wrong with our sample in that case, right? So comparing sample statistics to parameter statistics often helps you tell whether or not you have an accurate sample from your population. So that's all that the parameter does. Um, a statistic, on the other hand, is what I just mentioned, a subset of your population, otherwise known as a sample. So me taking 50 students at random from the university, that would be a sample. <coughs> um, frequency tables, we'll talk about that in a moment, but a frequency table uh, it gives us a table of a bunch of different values and possible, uh, I want to say like answers, but possible um, uh, categories of people that belong to a certain uh, grouping. So let's say we have a frequency table of the number of males versus females in the university or in our sample. So a frequency table would tell you, and I think I have one here somewhere. I'm gonna skip forward, but we'll get back to it. Um, here, this would be an example of, uh, this is a little bit more intense because we're doing a two by two, but if you would just take a, a look at one aspect of this, the total, this tells you in our sample, we have a total of 604 males and 772 females. This right here, just this one column, not looking at you know the questions of anything, but just looking at this uh, end result, that is what we call a frequency table. So we know the frequency or the ratio of males to females in our sample. All right, so we also have um, graphical summaries. We're able to take our data and make charts, which is a very cool thing to be able to do. And these charts are generally much more intense than the ones you can make on Excel. So that's one of the benefits of using this. Um, so we can do pie charts. I'm assuming you're familiar with pie charts, but it's a circle that shows you a slice that corresponds to the percentage of observations in a certain category. Bar charts are the ones that display vertical bars for each category. And of course, the height will determine how much you have, how many observations are in a certain category. <coughs> so um, that being said, let's do one of those. So let's go back to our SPSS spreadsheet, and we're going to do a pie chart. So in this case, we're going to follow along with the instructions here and go to graphs, pie summaries. This is uh, one thing, the newer SPSS got, uh, did away with it. In the past, we would be able to choose the type of uh, chart we were doing here, but now they put it under this subcategory of legacy. Um, so I did not write that in here. I should have, I forgot, but now we have to go here and then click the type of graph we want. Bar, 3D, line, area, pi, um, so in this case, we're going to do a pie chart. Um, and we want summaries of group cases. 
it's going to ask us what specific grouping do we want. So in this case, let's choose categories because we cannot do. Um, uh, so this is one ex uh, instance where you would need to have a categorical data. We cannot do this for quantitative data, right? If I had age, it would tell me one piece of the pie for every age group or every age uh, that there is. So for this reason, oftentimes we group things together into categorical data so that we can see things like this. So if I click uh, define slices by internet use category or better yet, you know, let's do age. We've been talking about age already. So let's talk, let's, let's do age. Um, and we should in a moment get a nice pie chart here. And it defines you each age category. But remember, we had to define this already. So generally using Excel or some other uh, program, we've already created these categories. So in this case, um, 18 through 29, if we double click, I think it was here, we can play with this a little bit more. Where was it? Hold on, I didn't want to go into Chart Builder. I wanted to go see. Uh, show data labels. Where is it? Things changed a lot this recent uh, iteration of SPSS. Show data labels. There it is. Okay, close. It shows you exactly, in this case, how many people there are in each category. Um, so depending on if you're a PC or a Mac user, it's slightly different. But in this case, you at least get to see there's 339 people in the 60 to 89 age group, for instance. Um, 251 in the 18 to 29. Now, as I mentioned, these are categorical data. There are categories of age groups, right? If I were to try and run the same exact thing, let's do the same exact thing, legacy dialogues, Hi, and I try to do this for a quantitative variable. Let's see what happens. So let's take this bad boy out and put in a new one. Look at how many categories there are. This doesn't tell us anything. It probably gives you a seizure by looking at it. Um, this is pointless, right? This is why it's important for us to have categorical data for certain things. It just makes sense and it's graphically nicer to output. Now, as I mentioned also, um, they have changed things. So now we have this chart builder. They think that it's easier for you to do it this way. I don't necessarily agree. Um, so for instance, I can go to Pi down here. I would have to drag this into here and then I would have to choose my variable i would have to drag the variable in here and all all the time it doesn't want to work i don't know why um so i stopped using this for now it's frozen so for this reason i stopped trying to use this chart builder i stick to the legacy dialogues it's just much easier to play with than uh, than that new chart builder All right, let's do the same thing for a bar graph now. So simply, we're going to do it the exact same way. Graphs, legacy dialogues, we'll choose bar. With just a simple bar, jar, uh, bar chart is enough. And we'll do the same again, age category. We put it into our category axis, and there's a lovely bar graph for us to see all of our um, age categories, how many are in each. So we have up till 400 here. So we can, you know, quickly look 30 to 39 is around 300, a little bit more than 300. We could verify this up here. 30 to 39 is, um, 311. So obviously this is, uh, correct. 
So there's multiple ways of viewing all of these things. It is simply put just a preference of which type of charts you prefer to use. All right, we have a lot of other graphical summaries as well. Up until now, these were, I believe, I said it right here for categorical variables. I did not mean to double click that. I just wanted to highlight the word categorical. Um, these are for categorical variables. Now for quantitative variables, we have similar things. We have dot plots, which shows a dot for each observation. Um, we have stem and leaf plots, which shows you uh, basically um, the, not the frequency, but the distribution of uh, our data sets. Histograms shows you frequencies, and scatter plots will generally display two variables and how they relate. This is your typical X and Y variables that you have probably uh, been familiar with you know, throughout your mathematics history. So we'll take a look at some of these as well. So let's, I was gonna open up a new uh, file here, but let's stick with the one that we have open just for the sake of time. <coughs> let's take a look at a histogram for, yeah, all right, I'll, I'll do what I, no, I don't want to close it. No, I don't want to close this. I want to open up the, I will open up the marathon one just so we follow along. Um, all right, so we're going to look at a histogram for, once again, multiple ways of doing this. This is a, um, a list of, let's see how many, quite a few. My God, this is a very long one. I didn't check yesterday how long this was. 20 something thousand, 28,000 um, people. And these are times, hours, age category, and gender and age of marathon runners. So let's take a look at a histogram. So we could do this once again, two ways. We could go to our graphs and go straight to histogram, which is down here. But there's another way of doing this. So I wanted to show you the second way. Um, we can go through descriptive statistics, which we did already, right? So we've gone to descriptives. So let's take a look at um, time, how long it took for these people to run the marathon. Um, so in this case, if we go to options, sorry, it was not under options. Where was it? Uh, Is this, am I in the right place? Was it somewhere else? Am I, am I blind? I thought it was here somewhere. Did it not say? I could have sworn I saw it here last time and give you the option of giving us a chart. All right, nonetheless, let's take a look at the histogram for the, or the descriptive uh, data for this, and then we'll do the, um, these are something that could have changed. So um, nonetheless, let's take a look at the completion time. So there's 28,764 participants. Um, the minimum time to run a marathon was two hours, 2.15 hours. Maximum was 8.44 with a mean of 4.3. Um, so that gives you the information for all of this. So as I mentioned, um, I don't know where I came up with this, but frequencies, charts. Oh, I, I'm assuming I was trying to do two different things. Um, so ignore what I'm trying to say here. Uh, first, I did frequencies, which is this, and then I'm going to do the charts. So second, we're going to go to graphs, histogram, and we're going to look at completion time. Oh, 
I'm, I uh, didn't choose the normal curve, but it shows you here a very nice histogram. And you can kind of see how uh, nice the data looks here. So um, if I do it again, and this time click on the correct thing, where was it, graphs? Um, I can choose the option. We're going to do the same exact thing. It's already there. But right here, display normal curve. And this shows us the normal curve um, like we you know, know about in uh, statistics, right? So it gives you an idea of how normally distributed your data is about your mean. Once again, if your data fits into the normal curve, that means you have this normally distributed data, which is very, very good for doing statistical analysis. All right, we're going to do one more example of this. I believe I'm in the same uh, chart as well. And in this case, we're going to do a scatter plot. So we're going to go to graphs. Once again, legacy scatter. And as I mentioned, we're going to do a simple scatter. And scatter plots allow you to combine two different variables. So we're going to define both of the variables that we want to do. So let's do uh, age on one axis, time <coughs> in hours on the other axis. I believe there is a an option somewhere here that allows you to uh, choose whether they are. Uh, so basically it only allows you to choose continuous and uh, quantitative variables. If I were to try to put age group in here, it might work, sorry. Oh, there you go. String variables not allowed. So as I mentioned, some things are limited by SPSS. So in this case, it was string because sex in this case, as I told you guys, if we go back to our chart, um, sex or gender is M and F. Male for female, male, male, M for male, F for female, right? So in this case, we are writing it out, and that's what a string variable is. So for the for whoever asked this earlier, this is an example of a string variable. It is not only a string, but if we look here, it's also categorical. So it has the three Venn diagrams for the category, and then it has a letter A designating that it is a string. So that being said, going back, we're going to do our analysis of a scatter plot of age versus time. <coughs> Let's see what we get. Boom. So you end up every age category. So if somebody was 20, they were down here. If somebody was, as they aged, their time didn't look like it increased very much. Um, so. Ironically, what this does for us, let me try to flip this. So the other thing that you can do, by the way, is you can always reverse the order uh, or the organization. So instead of having age down here, let's try this. Let's put age on our x-axis. See if it looks any better. Not really, right? There is a, a little bit of an uptick here. We could see that it moves upwards. Generally, this means that as we get older, ages down here, we could see that the time increases somewhat. But it's kind of uh, interesting to see that there is no distinct pattern in this case. It is just a massive giant blob, which means um, in this case, there is not much of a linear relationship between this data. So that's one thing that we can kind of look at here. Um, nonetheless, this one told us less than this one. This one gave us a little bit of, a, a, of this upturn, right? We see that the lowest numbers, the lowest marathon times were run by the people with the lowest ages. So that we can see. And also the highest numbers, except for this little guy right here, um, were run by people of older ages. But generally, a scatter plot allows us to see such things. All right, we only have half an hour left, so it might be a little bit longer than half an hour, but let's see. 
Um, once again, this is a generic data set. So I have no idea whether these are athletes or if these are random people that ran marathons. So we're just assuming it's random people. You know, you go to a marathon, uh, you know, if you look at things like the New York Marathon, um, I don't know how many participants run the New York Marathon every year, but there's a chance that you could get 20,000 people. You would have a very nice chart like this. Um, all right, moving on. Uh, we can do box plots. I'm going to skip this one because we're simply running out of time. Um, but you can do this one on your own. But as I said, there are multiple uh, chart types that you can analyze for um, from SPSS. All right. So now we've looked at data in terms of graphical and we've looked at uh, data in terms of numerical descriptors, right? <coughs> Descriptive statistics um, and, uh, you know, in terms of uh, descriptive statistics such as this, minimum, maximum, mean, and then we can visualize all of this data as well, which helps. So now we're going to move forward. Uh, these will all be discussed at the end of class, okay? If you're going to ask questions, please ask questions related to what we're talking about right then, as opposed to stuff that can be asked later. All right, so when we're dealing with data, um, another thing that we could look at is what is called a contingency table um, or a cross tabulation. Um, basically, I mentioned to you guys before, we had uh, up here, where was it? Uh, we mentioned frequency tables. I showed you a frequency table basically will tell you, um, simply put, what is the uh, age of, or not age, sorry, what is the gender of our sample, male versus female? That is a frequency table. Frequency could be, you know, 35 to 40. Um, so 35 males, 40 females. A contingency table takes that one step further. It now does two variables. It lists a specific answer to a specific question for each of those, um, for each of those uh, variables. So for instance, a uh, two by two contingency table for email use by gender. Um, from the first table that we looked at, let me close out this one. <coughs> from this table, we can look at a, a contingency table for um, email use by gender. I showed you, um, there's a uh, question here, a yes or no question. Where is it? Uh, I'll look at it on the variable view. It'll be easier. Um, something relating to email, email use right here. Uh, number 15, do they use email? Zero is no. And one is yes. Nine means no answer. So let's take a look at this. So this was variable 15. So if we go to variable 15, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, so somewhere around here, Email use right here. We have our zeros and ones. So it would be interesting to see um, whether males or females use internet or sorry, use email more. So we could do this. We could run a simple uh, contingency table by this. Um, and I will get into this more in a little bit because I will go through how to do this um, in the next slide. But for now, um, this would be an example of an output. So we have our males and our females. And then we have the answer to the question, no and yes, right? So in the terms of males, they said 328 said they did not use email. 276 said yes, they do. Females said 465 said no, and 307 said yes. So the total between this is 604 versus 772. So we know we have a higher female uh, number in our sample, but we can get an idea here whether uh, what the answers were like. So that is what we call a contingency table. We could kind of build this for any categorical variable. Once again, this is for categorical stuff, not quantitative. So 
if we want to take a look at something like this, we are kind of looking at differences. So let's say we want to know, okay, well, these responses, were they different or not? Did males use email differently than females? So in order to analyze this, this would be what is called a chi-squared analysis. Um, so a chi-squared determines whether there is a statistically significant difference between groups, um, in this case, between males and females, uh, for the question of internet e or sorry, email use. Um, so in general, we look at a, a, a null hypothesis of the variables are independent, meaning the variables, there is uh, no difference. Uh, on the other hand, we look at uh, uh, our alternative hypothesis as they are not independent means that there is a relationship between the two. So let's take a look at an example for this. So let's use this exact um, question and try to figure out whether there's a difference in this category uh, of email usage between males and females. So we would go to analyzed, we go to descriptive statistics, and we go to the category called cross tabs. We give it our categories that we're interested in, <coughs> uh, which is going to be, where is our gender somewhere here? Respondents sex. And we will look at use of email. Um, now, if I were to just click OK, it would give me that frequency table that we saw here, this output frequency table. But I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to go for statistics, and I'm going to tell it I want a chi-square analysis. So once again, we've already looked at this contingency table. Um, just by eyeballing this, I cannot tell you if there's a difference. Um, if we look at the ratios between these two, we can tell that both males and females there's a larger number of people who said they did not use email than they said they did. So let's see if statistically there's a difference between these. So once again, chi-squared analysis. Let's click OK and see what happens. So we get this table, which we've already seen. Um, it tells you a bunch of information about this. Um, the percentage of missing data. So it tells you we have valid 1,376 1, data points, which is 90% of all. We have 3% missing or 43, and the total was 1419. And then we get this contingency table, which we just mentioned, right? So we don't know anything about this. It doesn't make any real sense to us. So let's take a look at our chi-squared analysis. Now, within the chi-squared analysis, you will get a number of things. Specifically, you get your Pearson chi-square. And in this case, there's two ways we generally look at um, chi-squared analysis. The first one is what's called Pearson chi-squared. And the other one is what's called Fisher's exact test. Both of those are good assumptions of whether your um, model is correct or not. So generally speaking, um, uh, if we go back, to our original um, uh, thing here. We have our H naught and our H1. Um, basically, this, uh, what we look at here is, is that p-value less than 0.05? If it is, we reject the null hypothesis, okay? This means that our variables are not independent of one another, which means they are in fact the same. There is no difference between the two groups. So in this case, if we look at our, uh, either our Pearson chi-squared or our Fisher's exact test, they are 0 0.028 and 0 0.027, respectively. Um, so these are, of course, less than 0 0.05. And as such, they are not independent of each other. There is no statistically significant difference between these two groups. So if there was, we would get a higher p-value, and then that would tell us they are, in fact, um, independent of each other, meaning there is a difference. 
So generally, when we look at these p-values, as I was just showing you here, right, these p-values, um, the p-values tell you whether something is statistically significant or not. What this means is, um, uh, as I was giving you the example of shoe size, or, or what was it, sorry, no, age between people, right? Um, we could say that there's a difference um, between, you know, let's say that we have two means. One is 0 0.1 and the other one's 0 0.2. The question becomes, is that a significant difference or not? Well, the answer is, it depends. And that is what this statistical analysis is trying to tell us, right? In some cases, 0 0.1 difference might not mean anything. If I have five people and I'm looking at height and th you know the difference between the two uh, uh, the, the means of these two groups of five are 0 0.1, I would probably say that there, there's not a statistically significant difference there because I do not have a lot of uh, people in my sample. Um, however, if I had 10 million people in each group, and was comparing those two groups, and the difference was 0 0.1, I can bet you that that 0 0.1 would be significant because by having enough data points, you eliminate all of the noise, so to speak, so that 0 0.1 would be significant. So ideally, what this 0 0.5 is trying to tell you in statistical terms is, if we replicate this comparison, a uh, hundred times, 95 out of a hundred times, we're going to get the same result as what we just saw. 0 0.05 means 5% of the time, we will get a different um, answer. So once again, if I have a group of, you know, the larger the group, the more likelihood that I'm going to be confident about this answer, right? So, um, your quick example of this, um, you know, if you have a, a product that you're trying to buy on Amazon and you have a um, review or a star review <coughs> of 4.7, um, you would say, okay, well, that's pretty good. But then, of course, if it's one review that gave it a 4.7 versus a you know, a million reviews, they gave a product of 4.7. I would trust the million reviews with an average of 4.7 before I'm going to trust one random person with a 4.7 review, right? So this is what's, you know, kind of uh, uh, the crux of statistics. The more data you have, the more correct or the more uh, um likely it is that your numbers, your calculations are going to be accurate. All right, now, um, so as I just showed you, we can do these differences between groups using chi-squared, but that only works if we have categorical variables. If we have quantitative variables and we wanna do the exact same thing, we are going to look at a t-test. So a t-test is gonna tell us the exact same thing, whether there's differences in means between two groups. So once again, a t-test looks at differences in means. Chi-squared looks at differences in frequency, right? In essence, it's kind of similar. A frequency is how many times something happens. But if I have males and females, I cannot have a mean. I cannot have an average of males and females, right? If males are one and females are two, my average is gonna be a 1.5. That's not gonna tell me anything, right? So we look at counts or frequencies, how many males versus how many females. Um, in t-tests, we look at means because we have quantitative categorical, or sorry, quantitative uh, uh, data and not categorical data. So in the same way, we can compare two different things. Um, I'm not going to go into one-sided versus two-sided hypothesis tests um, at this point. That's beyond the scope of this workshop. But for now, um, we will do a similar example for um, comparing two quantitative uh, variables. 
So let's do an analysis. Um, so for instance, let's quickly look at this here. Um, our hypotheses are always going to be that there is either no difference, there is a greater than or less than difference. These are our alternative hypotheses. This is what we're trying to test. What does this mean? Um, the things we could test for in terms of t-tests, um, does anorexia induce positive weight change? Meaning, does your average go up? Is the Coke in a can equal to 12 ounces? Do radio advertisements increase uh, sales of hamburgers, for instance, right? These are all different types of questions. If we had the data set, we could potentially answer. So we're going to do one of these quickly. So what? Uh, going back to the marathon one, because generally speaking, in that marathon one, we have so much, uh, so many data points that it's it's uh, nice to deal with. Um, let's ask the question: Is the mean age of marathon runners greater than thirty? So how would we do this? So we're going to go to compare means. So analyze, compare means, and we're doing a one sampled t-test. So we want to do age. And in the test value, you put what you want to compare it against. So uh, we can also choose our confidence interval, meaning 95% gives you that 5% p-value that we're looking for. If I put it to 90%, it could give you a 10% p-value, but we're not going to go into that right now. It's, it's once again a, a something for another day. Significance letters on bar charts. That's an interesting question. Um, I have never used uh, significance letters on a bar chart. I know what you mean. Um, generally speaking, I utilize uh, things like um, correlation matrices and have significance on there. Um, I've never done a bar chart with significance letters. Um, I know, uh, I think SAS can do it. Um, I've never tried it in SPSS. So I can't answer that one uh, for you. We could try, but uh, um, you, know, you could manually always add it by doing the bar chart and then you adding the, um, the significance in there as well. But once again, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means I don't know. So I've never used it before. Um, now in this, uh, let's see if this is going to be significant. So once again, uh, we do, we look at our age. We have, in this case, where is it? Uh, here it is. Our mean age is 35.5, right? Um, so out of our 28,000 respondents, our mean age is 35.5. Let's, let's remember this 35.5 because I'm going to do something else for you. Um, now, if our P is less than 0.05, in this case, it means there is a significant difference from the number we put in. So yes, um, the question becomes, is it greater than or less than? As I mentioned to you, we do not rely on one-sided. Uh, we look at the two-sided p-values on SPSS because it will not tell you directionality. So if we get a significant result here, which we have a significant result, all that tells us is there is a significant difference, specifically of 5.503. But we don't know if this is positive or negative. Um, so we will have to do that interpretation on our own. So if we're looking at a mean of 35 of our sample size, we know that our test variable or test value was 30. Obviously, we can tell that the mean age of our runners was significantly greater than 30. And we could tell that by looking at the mean as well as the, um, the p-result. 
we set that. So we just set that. So that's, uh, I'm going to do another one of these in a moment. So right now we set our test value. So the question here is, is the mean age of marathon runners greater than 30? This is arbitrary. You can choose it. So let's say I want to choose 35.5. So we do the same exact thing we just did, compare means, one sample t-test, and we're going to up this, let's say 35.5. Now, it is no longer less than 0.05. This means there is no statistically significant difference between the mean of our sample size and our test value that we randomly input. Because, of course, that is the mean. Right, so we know that we cheated here, but uh, if you didn't know this, this could be a question that you ask. And one more thing that we can do is we can analyze something the other direction. Let's say 20. <coughs> and in this case, there is once again a statistically significant difference, but as I told you. SPSS in its infinite wisdom does not give you directionality. You will have to figure that out on your own. So we know there's a 15.5 difference. We just don't know in which direction. It could be less. It could be that the average uh, age of our runners was five, right? I mean, obviously it's not possible, but you know, if you didn't know the context, you could guess that. Um, so all we know is that our test value is 20. There was a mean difference of 15.5. It could be lower than, it could be greater than. But that's why we have this mean up here. We know for a fact now that our mean is 35.5. Therefore, our test value is 20. Um, as such, the mean is greater than our test value. And this difference is statistically significant. All right. So that is how we do, um, once again, our, uh, our t-tests. Once again, we look at these p-values, right? Um, p-values just tell you the percentage chance that you are wrong in a nutshell, right? So there's a 5% chance I'm wrong that there's a difference between these. However, there's a 95% chance I am right. So this is why we use this 0.05. We generally assume that um, this is a good enough balance of right versus wrong um, when we're doing our analysis. All right, I'm going to move into two sample t-tests, in which case we're going to be doing a little bit something different. We're, we're, we might go over time today because this is, once again, a lengthy and complicated uh, thing that we're dealing with. But um, in this case, we're comparing two different means to each other. So in this case, we were comparing something to a preset value. In the next one, we're going to be comparing two different means to each other. For instance, we could compare two means, so uh, two means of different groups. So do women tend to spend more time on housework than men? Do men and women watch the same amount of television in a day? All of these are generally comparing two groups, means of two groups to each other. So let's take a look at this. Um, are male runners older than female runners? It's a fair question. Let's take a look. So in this case, we go to analyze, compare means, but this time we're doing a paired, or sorry, independent sample t-test. Um, so we need two things to input here. One is our test variable. Our test variable is going to be age. Your test variable is your quantitative variable. But then we want to break it up between two groups, right? We want to have a grouping variable. In this case, it's going to be sex, male and female. Um, now, we have to define in this case, because remember, these are, um, we did this, you see the little A here. Um, if I take it back, it has a little A, which means we did this as a string variable. SPSS does not like string variables, so we have to define each group. Group one is going to be our males. Group two is going to be our females. <coughs> so now it says sex, male, female. We've defined our groups. 
So let's see if there's a difference in age between males and females. So immediately we see that there is 17,000 males and 11,000 11, females. The average age of males is 37. The average age of females is 33. Immediately, just by looking at this, with this many numbers and that big of a gap, it's going to be significant. With time, you will understand how by glancing at statistics, whether these differences are going to be meaningful or not. Um, but now let's take a look at our differences. This is the independent samples test. And once again, our significance is lower than 0 0.001. So in this case, we are looking at our T test for equality of means. If your P is greater than 0.05, that means there is not a difference. If they are less, that means there is a difference. So, um, that is how these you know, comparisons work between groups as well. It's in essence, the same thing we're doing here, but instead of comparing to a set uh, number, we're comparing against two groups. And in the same way, if our P is less than 5, 0.05, there is a significant difference between, uh, this one was for completion time, we did age, but nonetheless, the same thing applies uh, in age for uh, males and females. If we want to do completion time, we can run that as well. Let's look back, compare means, independent sample t-test. Instead of age, let's take that completion time in hours and see if there's a difference. Once again, we look at the average first. This one's a little bit different. We don't know the context of this, right? Males 4.1, females 4.5. We Maybe that's not that big of a difference. I don't know, right? So we look at our significant or our, our uh, t-test to tell us whether this is significant or not. Um, and in this case, it is 0 0.000. As such, um, as such, we cannot. Um, uh, we can, can uh, we can say significantly, statistically significantly, that there is in fact a difference between these two groups. Once again. SPSS does not tell us directionality. We have to figure that out for ourselves by looking at these means. So all this tells us, two-sided p-test being less than 0.05 tells us, yes, there's a significant difference. All right, fantastic. We look back up here. Which direction is it? Males are less than females. So you have to use both of these tables in conjunction with each other to figure out what the whole picture is. All right, uh, this is less likely uh, to be used. Um, we're running out of time, but we, I wanna do two, a couple more things. Um, you can compare groups within the same. Uh, so as of now, we're doing independent tests. We're comparing males to females. These are independent samples. However, if we do um, before and after times, so for instance, let's say we have a grouping. We have uh, marathon times. I don't have the statistics for this, so we're ignoring this. Uh, but let's say we have a group of people um, who ran a marathon, then went on some ridiculous workout plan, and then ran a marathon again. Um, and we have a before and after time for each person, and we want to compare those two. Um, those are no longer independent. Those are dependent samples, aka matched pairs. So we need to be able to compare those two in a different way. So for instance, um, does cell phone use impact driver reaction time? Meaning we test drivers, they react to something. We put a cell phone in their hand, we measure them again, their reaction time, and see if it's different. Um, does exercise help blood pressure? We have someone, we measure their blood pressure, have them exercise over a period of time, test it again and see if it happens. That's a before and after. 
So um, we can do this. This is very possible for us to do. <coughs> um, so quickly, there's a few things I want to show you guys. First and foremost, if you have an Excel spreadsheet, this is one thing I wanted to mention, you can simply copy and paste your data into SPSS. So I'm going to do this now because it is important for you to know this as well. So let's open up a new worksheet for this. New data, if you saw I went to file, new and data, it gives me a blank worksheet. So if I'm in SPSS, I can literally copy and paste, or sorry, in Excel, I can copy and paste this data into here. Um, especially because I highlighted the variable, na variable names, I'm going to paste with variable names. So now beautifully, I have my before and after. So copying stuff into from Excel into SPSS is super easy. So I don't want you guys to be scared of that by any chance, right? It's nothing special. But now we do have to go into our variables and look at, we have two endorphin levels before and after a procedure, for instance, or before and after something happened, a treatment. Um, so we want to know, is there a difference in endorphin level before between these people, before and after? So in our variable view, the things you generally want to make sure is that we're on scale. This is the number one thing you want to check, is that you have the correct um, value here. Obviously, these are not groups. They're not nominal. These are not ordinal. These are scales. We're measuring the endorphin levels of people. I'm not a medical doctor. I know nothing about endorphins. I'm just going off of this example data set. But nonetheless, what we can do is compare the before and after. So in this case, each one of these is one patient. So we have one, two, three, four, five, all the way to 11 patients. So we would like to know if there's a difference before and after from these 11 patients. So these are no longer independent sample t-tests. We cannot run it the same way as we did with that independent sample. We have to choose paired sample because these are paired data points that we're comparing. So before, after, right? We can do this in multiple variables. What we don't need to, we only have one. Um, I'm making sure, yeah, we got nothing there. Um, Let me double check that we don't have anything missing. So the question here, by the way, is do beta endorphin levels differ before and after running a half marathon? So let's run it and see what happens. So we have 11, our N is equal to 11. There's a positive correlation and our P value is borderline. Uh, remember, we're using two-sided, so we're not going to be looking at one-sided. So in this case, there is not a significant difference there. Oh, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong table. Paired samples test. There it is. This is the correlation. Uh, okay, sorry, uh, my mistake. So the correlation, if you, uh, we'll talk about correlation in a moment, but when you look at a simple uh, chart, if we go back here, if we have a line going through this, right? We can always put a least squares line regression analysis into any data point, right? Just because I have a, a line in here does not mean that it's a perfect fit. So this first thing here is telling me uh, my correlation. So my correlation is 0.515, um, which means it's an upward trajectory, an upward slope, but it is not significant, meaning there is not a significant uh, correlation between this, uh, between these two numbers. However, that doesn't matter for us. We're not looking at whether these two are correlated. We're looking at whether there's a difference or not. And in that case, there is a significant difference of less than 0 0.001. So in this case, we can say that there is a difference before and after and we have to look back once again what this difference is after was significantly higher than before. 
right? So we can go back and answer a question that beta endorphin levels were higher after the marathon than before. So that is a um, comparison of paired t-tests. All right, and now, as I mentioned, going back to this uh, uh, correlation, let's talk about regression analysis. That's the last thing we're gonna do today. We'll finish this up quickly, so we shouldn't be going over by more than like 10 minutes. Um, all right, so the last thing you might need to do in SPSS, in, in basic SPSS, is dealing with linear regressions. And going back all the way to algebra, linear regressions are simply linear relationships modeling uh, responses that are scales. Um, you have one dependent variable. <coughs> Excuse me. One dependent variable and one or more independent variable. The independent variables change. The dependent variable uh, changes based on the independent variables. Now, if you remember back in algebra, y equals mx plus b, that was the slope of, or the, the equation for a line, right? And that's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to find a line that helps predict what could happen in a data point that you don't have a response for. So what does this mean? Let's take a look. So uh, does the, uh, the, we're going back to our first data sheet, if you recall this one, and I asked the question, does the number of hours worked uh, accurately predict the number of hours of email usage? You would assume that those two would go together, right? So we would expect a significant relationship between the number of hours worked and the number of hours spent on email. So let's take a look at how we would do this. So we go to analyze, we go to regression, and we're doing a simple linear regression. Our dependent variable, in this case, we're trying to predict the number of email usage, so or the hours of email usage. So our dependent variable would be hours of internet usage per week. Or no, we said email, not, uh, not hours of email usage per week, this one. And our independent variable was the number of hours worked in the last week. So let me double check that this is the correct one. Yes, it is. And let's see what we wanted to say um nothing there that's fine um well, let's throw out a histogram while we're here um so you can do some uh charts at the same time but anyway so we're trying to figure out whether the number of hours worked will accurately predict the number of hours you spent on email. So if we do this, we look at our model summary and we're looking at, where's my, our significance, we can look at it in two places here. Um, it is not significant, it is, or sorry, it is significant, 0 0.007. I briefly thought I said 0 0.07. No, so it is significant. 0 0.007 is less than 0 0.05, meaning this is a significant relationship. Um, so this is, once again, an accurate estimate. So you can accurately estimate the number of hours a person spends on email based on the number of hours they spent at work that week. So the two places you look at that would be either the whole regression equation here, or you could look at it as the variable, the coefficient you put in here. If we had multiple coefficients, which we could put in multiple variables, um, I'll do that in a second for you, you could see each one lined up here and you could look at each variable independently. And here's our chart showing our equation uh, or our frequency of, of our responses. Um, now, Let's take a look at exactly what I was saying. What happens if there's multiple variables? So let's do not one, but let's put in age. Is there a difference? Can we predict the hours of email per week based on number of hours worked and age? So 
look at our significance, it is still significant, 0.023. So the whole model with both things in it is significant. But what if we want to know each individual one? Here is the breakdown. This is what's funny here is that age of respondents did not significantly tell us anything about the, the emails per week, the email usage per week. However, once again, number of hours did. And nonetheless, because these two together were still very significant or still were significant together, doesn't mean just because your overall model was significant doesn't mean every variable was significant. So this coefficient chart will tell you the individual uh, variables and whether they themselves were significant or not. Uh, we could do the interaction between variables as well. That's an excellent point. Let's do that. Um, there's a number of ways to do this. Let me see if regression does it by itself. I think there is something somewhere. Oh, yeah, I remember how to do it. Um, so number of hours worked and age of respondent highlight both oh no there's a way let me find it there's another way of doing this i will show you if i can't find it here i know there is a thing of if i choose both All right, there's a more complicated version of, I know it's here somewhere, but I'm not dealing with, um, all right, let's go, let's get out of here. So the other way that we could do this is by going into um, analyze, and we have this uh, generalized linear models. And we do the same thing here. It asks us what we want to do, a linear regression. Um, so this is how I would normally do this, but I was trying to mess with it in the other. So, so here, our dependent variable, we choose the same thing. Uh, it was the number of email per week. Now for predictors here, we choose we have factors and covariates. Covariates are, uh, are categorical factors. In some cases, we can have factors that are, uh, sorry, uh, covariates are quantitative, factors are, are uh, not. So in some different, I'll show you what we mean by this, but uh, now we're not gonna worry about this, but in uh, some cases you can use uh, non-quantitative variables within linear models but we're not gonna mess with that now. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna pick our variables, number of hours and age of respondents. Then in this one, we can define our model. And this is exactly what we want. Hours, age, and then interaction, we select both. And then this way, it will allow us to do the two main effects as well as the interaction. So let's take a look at that. Um, and it gives you the same output. It's just a slightly different way of going about getting the same output. Um, so let's take a look. The output is slightly different, um, but here is the three things. So number of hours worked, 0.039. Remember, the more variables you throw in, sorry, this is for test of model effects. Uh, no, this is fine. So 0.039. So the more things you throw in, the less precise your model becomes. So number of hour worked is still significant. Age of respondent is not, and the interaction between age and hours work is also not significant in this case. All right, almost done here. One more thing I wanna do for you guys is, the last one is what's called a binary logistic regression. Seriously, five minutes and we're done. Um, a binary logistic regression is what we use when, did someone say something? 
Do we have a question? All right, so a logistic regression is what we use when we have a binary dichotomous dependent variable, meaning yes or no, male or female, and we're looking at groupings. So in this case, let's try to see, does the number of hours worked accurately predict gender? Do males or females work more is the idea, right? So let's take a look at our chart here and we'll do the same thing. So in this case, analyze back to regression, but this time we're choosing binary logistic. So in this case, our dependent variable has to be dichotomous, meaning there's only two categories. So male or female. Respondent sex, there it is. And our covariates, in this case, we will use number of hours worked. And we'll run this. So it was significant. Where is it? Sorry. Right here, variables in the equation. Um, so our variable in the equation was number of hours worked. Let me check the question. Okay. Um, number of question, uh, number of hours worked, and it was significant at the P001 level. So this means that we can accurately predict using the number of hours worked, whether somebody was a male or a female. Now using the same thing, we can go ahead and put in uh, covariates. We can do any number of things, but the only difference between a binary logistic and a regular linear regression is in a linear regression, our dependent variable is going to be um, scalar and our dependent variable in a binary logistic is going to be um, dip, uh, dichotomous or binary. All right, guys, I'm sorry I went over the time by a few minutes, but that is what I wanted to show you guys today. So hopefully that was a good enough introduction for you guys uh, for um, SPSS. I know, once again, it's a lot of stuff. Um, to put it into an hour and a half is tough. Um, but hopefully you got something out of it. We'll make everything available to you guys. I will email the um, data sets as well as the PowerPoint to Amrutha and she will share it with the rest of you. So once again, thank you guys. If you have any questions, we can still talk about it. I'm in no massive rush, so you can ask questions still. But if you have to go, you're more than welcome to go as well. All right, so Amrutha, I'm going to send you the, um, the slides and the... Okay. All right, so I'll send those right now and you can share with the rest. Okay, sure. All right, so thank you, everybody, and thank you have so a good much. evening. You too, doctor. Thank you so much. No problem. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>